sabrosura pa ti que que. It wasn't until I got to college that I found out what first gen even meant. I distinctly remember the moment I realized I was first gen, but I didn't have a name for it. I just realized I was different. Because I realized, wow, like, yeah, I'm like, I'm not the only one. Because I always felt like there was something wrong with me. But I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. So it's actually set us off on this really um, empowering journey of owning our identities and embracing how we are. And I'm still learning to this day. Today I'm very passionate about supporting the quote unquote non-traditional student. And by that, I mean everything that strays from the norm. So I work with first gen BIPOC students, but I also um, tend to attract people who also have chronic illnesses or who are also neurodivergent or who are also parents. And I'm, I'm glad that I can serve them to the best you know, way that I can uh, because th that support is sorely needed. Hello everyone, this is Bam, the Cafe con Bam, the bilingual podcast that features Latine and people of the global majority who break barriers, change lives, and make this world a better place. Today, we have a conversation with Dr. Yvette martinez Wu. Dr. Yvette is a first-generation chronically ill and neurodivergent Chicana academic coach, author, and speaker. She's a producer and host of the globally top-rated Grad School Fem Turing podcast and founder of Grad School Fem Turing LLC, where she empowers first-generation BIPOC as they navigate higher education. Dr. Yvette is the co-author of the book, Is Grad School For Me? Navigating the Application Process for First-Gen BIPOC Students with the University of California Press and co-editor for the best of the best-selling Chicana Mother Work Anthology with the University of Arizona Press. Listeners, this conversation with Dr. Yvette was really warm because we got to, of course, explore her story and how her family dealt with her child's autism diagnosis, how neurodivergent and being chronically ill played in her life and decisions when it came to to her career. It was really cool to explore and also for me as the rebel against academia because it's such a gatekeeping world. <laughs> You'll hear also how Dr. Yvette kind of like gives us really cool tips when it comes to navigating the questioning whether grad school is for us or not. Y bueno, sin más, here's my conversation with Dr. Yvette martinez -Bu. Dr. Ivette, welcome to Cafe Compound. Thank you. ¿Cómo estás? I am doing pretty good in spite of the time of the month that it is for me right now. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> it's always a plus. That's one of the things I was like, I am I am a chronic oversharer. <laughs> and when someone asks me, how are you doing? I constantly have to fight the urge. And then, then I give up of like, nah, I, I want to say the the thing that's expected and then I end up oversharing. <laughs> and you know, I, I know you're neurodiverse and I think for me as an ADHD brain, oversharing is a thing. Yes, it really is. Because we don't see it as an overshare. It's more like that's what it is <laughs> type thing. Right. You're asking me, how are you doing? And I'm going to be uh, open and honest about it. <laughs> I've always had trouble with lying. <laughs> <laughs> and then with, with not answering people's questions in a very frank, direct way. Someone asked me a question instead of me thinking about, you know, whatever they meant to ask. You right. Know, what, what the subtext was, I just go for... The actual answer. Strip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How are you doing? I am doing not bad. <laughs> and what I find hilarious is when people are like... You actually give them how you're doing like this time, you know, like based on the time of the month. So I find it super comical when people don't know how to respond. I've had that as well. <laughs> One too many times. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. But back to your story. Tell us what's your heritage. My heritage is I was born and raised in the Southern California area in the San Fernando Valley. I am a daughter of Mexican immigrants. So on my dad's side, he's from Hermosillo, Sonora. On my mom's side, she's from Agualulco, Jalisco. They both came to the U.S. in their teens, met 
in the valley in Southern California, and my family is there to this day. <laughs> I am not there actually now. I'm currently residing in the Las Vegas, Nevada area, but I've lived around a couple of areas on the West Coast and and in Europe. <laughs> yeah, fun. So, how was it for you to grow up in as a first gen? In an immigrant household, and was education a thing for you always? Yeah, education was definitely a coping mechanism for me because you know I grew up in a home that was not very stable. There was abuse in the household, and my father actually suddenly passed away when I was twelve. He was forty-two. It was a sudden brain aneurysm. So young. Yes, he was really young. I'm like, ooh. I'm in my mid 30s. Well, you know, like as I get closer to the 40s, I'm like, oh no. And I'm a I'm a mom, so I picture my son who's 10. I'm like, two years later, that that was the age that I was when I lost my dad. Yeah. Going back to your question about yeah, being first gen and school being a thing, it was a place that felt really safe for me. Even though I struggled a lot, so I've always been that person that on the outside I seem like I have my shit together. So I'm like that duck, uh, you know, on the top mm -hmm. of the water. It's mm -hmm. very, very calm and serene. But on the bottom, going like this, that's like that's my mind. My mind's like, da -da 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 -da. and so as a kid, I was always told I was like too dramatic, too sensitive, that I was very anxious, and so my coping strategy was perfectionism, people pleasing. I'm the eldest daughter, so I took on a lot of labor, caregiving responsibilities. I'm the eldest daughter too. So I'm a middle child, but I'm the eldest daughter, and for me, that's that means something, and um, that meant that yeah, I took on a lot of responsibilities, had to quote unquote grow up quick, mm -hmm. and that led to me being the first in my family to move out of the home, to go to college, and so it wasn't until I got to college that I found out what first gen even meant. I remember, I distinctly remember the moment I realized I was first gen, but I didn't have a name for it. I just realized I was different was when I went and met my roommate when I stayed at the dorms at UCLA and my roommate had parents who had gone to college and who had careers, they were lawyers, doctors, and they were asking me where my family was and what my family did. And I awkwardly said, well, my mom just dropped me off and said, you know, Vaya con Dios. Sí, claro. <laughs> and my dad is, he's dead. And I just was, would always awkwardly answer that question when people would ask me, what do your parents do for a living? I'm like, well, my mom sells veladoras and my dad's not around. That was the moment that I realized I was first gen. Uh, and then in participating in first gen programs, I was able to, to articulate that experience a little bit better. Yeah. Mm. I want to backtrack a little and talk about that 12-year-old Yvette at the time. How did you deal with the loss of your father at that age? You know what? It hit all of us very hard. I'm one of six kids. So I mentioned mm -hmm. I'm the middle child. So I'm the third born out of six. It hit us all very hard, all very different. I, in, I guess in retrospect, I'm thinking I was very lucky that I had people to watch out for me because even though I was at a very like critical formative age, mm -hmm. I did have a counselor in middle school, Mr. Leandro. Uh, I, you know, I have a very, very bad memory, but there are some key figures that I'll never forget in my life. Mr. Leandro was the one that recommended that I seek support and therapy and sign me up for a grief group. And that was when I realized in middle school, I started going to these weekly meetings with other youth who, like me, had lost loved ones. So I met other kids my age who had lost their siblings. I remember meeting a kid my age who had lost everyone in his family. He was the only survivor of a car crash. Oh, my God. Yeah. And that just like stayed with me, which kind of led me to like dealing with some other issues of like constantly feeling like my issues were not enough because I would compare myself and say, well, it's not as bad as so-and-so. Now I know to honor where I'm at and, you know, whatever it is that's hurting me and not to compare. That was really, really helpful. Having the support of the community, of teachers, of counselors, and of course, you know, having a really strong mom. My mom, you know, she's this, has been the sole provider, has her own business. She has actually taught me a good amount about entrepreneurship, uh, having made that leap just a couple years ago. 
yeah, through her support, that's how we all kind of have made it work to this day. But that's not to say that I, that it's not still <laughs> a wound that a lot of us carry, like my siblings and I carry. I've had a lot of time in therapy. I've been going to therapy since I was 12. So I've had, what, 20 plus years of therapy to process it. And I know that's not the case for everyone else in my family, unfortunately. Yeah. Were there any conversation inside the home happening or did you mainly deal with this with your therapist counselor grief group? I think primarily in the grief group and with friends, with close friends. In the home, it was survival mode. So my mom was just focusing on getting us to survive, keeping a roof on top of our heads, feeding us. And with my siblings, I wish I could say that we had these open and honest conversations. But like I said, you know, earlier, it was and continues to be an open wound for some of my relatives. So I know I just don't bring it up because it can still be a touchy subject. But when I talk about it, when I talk about my dad or about other kind of formative moments or other losses in, in our family, um, yeah, I mostly, I, I to this day have a therapist. So I mostly process these things through close friendships, some of my soul sisters and through, through therapy, through my therapist. For sure, so important. How do you think your family members that didn't have access to therapy deal, deal with it? Is it like a... Lo ponemos abajo de la alfombra and sí. just don't talk about it. Sí. Uh, muchas cosas son así. And that's why I am a little bit of a socially awkward person in the family because I have done things a little bit differently. I do like to be open and honest and bring up certain conversations. I, I think that my siblings have done the best that they can in light mm -hmm. of their circumstances. So my, you know, one of my eldest brother, he actually was the first to go to college but he didn't finish. Why didn't he finish? Because he was first gen too, and he felt that immense responsibility of financially providing as the eldest son and worked multiple jobs at the time. And so he pursued, you know, going straight to a career. So like he now has a career in real estate and other things that he does on the side. I have another elder brother similarly went straight to the workforce. <laughs> But they now have families and lives of their own, and they seem to be doing as best as they can in light of their circumstances. So I, I don't want to say that, like, I don't know what they've done to process it on their own. Maybe they go to therapy and haven't told me. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, it, everyone copes in, in the ways that they their capacity allows, you know? And Yeah. So for you, as the eldest daughter, middle child... How was it for you to witness perhaps your older brother who went to college and then because of expectations, because of internal narratives, whatever it is, he didn't finish. Was that a catalyst for you to be like, okay, I'm a finish? In some ways, yes. In other ways, sometimes I would forget. I would forget that my eldest brother went because it felt like mm. such a new experience and I wasn't so close to him that I could seek out advice. So I never went to him to be like, how did it go? How did you navigate financial aid? How did you do this? Everything, I felt like I was on my own. And it's really interesting, too, because there's been, out of the six, three of us that have gone to college, two of us that have finished, and all of us ended up going to UCLA. So my baby brother, and he's not a baby, he was, <sighs> he was born in 2000, so he's in his 20s now. Yeah. <laughs> But my youngest brother recently graduated from UCLA as well. And it's interesting because I would constantly be like, hey, I'm here if you need any advice, if I can help you in any way. And, and he also, in many ways, did it on his own, like rarely sought out help or advice. But yeah, I think in the back of my head, I did have it in me that, okay, I, I do want to finish. It wasn't necessarily to like finish what he, my eldest brother wasn't able to, but mm. it was, I've always had this strong, I don't know what the way, um, how to describe this trait, but If you get an idea in my head, I will do it. It's just one of those things. Like, I, I always say I'm a doer. Like, mm. do not get an idea in my head. No matter how crazy, how wild, mm. how whatever, I will do it. <laughs> I got an idea to move abroad to Portugal. And then six months later, I was, I was there. So it's just, the, these are some things about me. It's like, if you get an idea in my head, I will do it. And so I had this idea since my youth, like... I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to college. I didn't know what college was. I just, it just seemed 
the thing that you that people did to get out of poverty. And so mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to college. And I was so set on it that I, there was no stopping me. What's your undergrad in? English literature and theater minor. I actually was involved in theater, theater acting and stage managing f- for many years up until my from fourth grade, actually, every year until my junior year of college. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's it's wild to me now because if I think about how long has it been, it might it might be like 15 years or more so that since I stopped doing theater. And so it feels like it was such a long time ago, but it was also such a big part of my life at the time. Mm-hmm. And the reason I stopped is because I realized or made the decision that I wasn't going to pursue that as a career. And in my head, what was the next best thing? At the time, I was introduced to undergraduate research, and my professors thought that I'd make a good professor, and that set me off on a professorial track, which ultimately I did not end up doing, but that's a that's a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's actually why I do what I do now. Like That kind of ties into why I, yeah, I'm an academic coach now. For sure. In my mastermind yesterday, we talked about what we want and sometimes borrowing things from others. And that sounds like you borrowed (laughs) that journey of being a professor and because somebody thought you were going to be good at it. And so sometimes we adopt things that, you know, get planted on us and it's like, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. But then ultimately, it's not what we really want. And I think that's like why it's so important to to always like stay connected within ourselves and ask us ourselves, what do I actually want? A lot of us are not taught that though. Totally. Absolutely. How was it for you when you went into this path with this borrowed goal and when do you realize you didn't want it? Usually when I introduce myself and I say a little bit more about my quote unquote origin story, so the things that kind of set me off to the the track or the life that, I, that I'm living right now is uh, there were three kind of formative moments in my graduate school time that impacted the trajectory of my career in life and what I'm doing today. So the, the first thing, I didn't know right off the bat, but I, I realized, okay, this is a thing and maybe I might pursue this as a career, was immediately when I started my doctoral program in theater and performance studies, I started working as a graduate mentor. And in that role, I got to shepherd undergraduates, help them apply to graduate school, teach them about the hidden curriculum. And I realized, wow, I'm like, I'm really, really good at this. It feels really, really good. I enjoy it. This might be a thing. Like, how can I keep doing this? But I I was still on that track of becoming a theater professor at the time. But then my second year of graduate school, I developed a series of chronic illnesses and, you know, just whole body issues from like migraines, tummy issues, bladder issues, a bunch of issues that I developed in graduate school. And it's no surprise I was burnt out at the time. I wasn't listening to my body. I was just working, working, working. And it led to my body kind of shutting down. And that's when I realized I'm going to need to change some things because I cannot keep going at this pace. Otherwise, I'm just not, I'm not going to survive. So that was the second thing that kind of indicated to me, I might need to do things differently. And then the third one was I had a child in grad school. I became a mama. And that was, I mean, the whole story of his birth is wild because I experienced complications. I hemorrhaged. I lost three liters of blood. It was just, even I had complications during my pregnancy. It was, it was a rough ride. But in becoming a mother, I really, really learned how to start advocating for myself and advocating for him and for my family. And so it, it, it emboldened me becoming a mom. And that's when I started doing advocacy work. And I started conducting research on mothers of color and higher education. And I formed collectives. One of them was the Chicana Mother Work Collective. And we started presenting at conferences, publishing work. We co-edited a best-selling anthology all to shed light on like, wow, there's there's so many populations that are non-traditional in higher ed settings that need more support. And that was one of them that I was focusing on. And even to this day, I'm very passionate about supporting the quote unquote non-traditional student. And by that, I mean everything that strays from the norm. So 
I work with first-gen BIPOC students, but I also tend to attract people who also have chronic illnesses or who are also neurodivergent or who are also parents. And I'm, I'm glad that I can serve them to the best you know, way that I can uh, because that support is sorely needed. So yeah, by the end of my grad school journey, I realized I don't think I want to become a professor anymore. The values are not aligned. I'm not valuing research. You know, research is not at the top of my list of things that, that nourish me, replenish me, that like really made me feel purposeful. And so I pursued a career in higher ed through serving students directly. So through student affairs, academic affairs, running research preparation programs. Yeah, then COVID hit and that all that again, it was another one of those moments where I found myself working from home for the first time in my life with elementary age child doing online distance learning. My son, he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum at age three. So he was really, really struggling with online distance learning. I had had my second child, so I was breastfeeding a newborn. Okay, hold on. You're going way too fast in your story. I have questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am. I can't help it. I have so much to say. <laughs> so you're, you're an undergrad. You're studying theater. How do you know that graduate school is a thing? Because some colleges and universities have undergraduate research programs, graduate school preparation programs that are geared for low-income first-gen students, and they will promote their programs, get them in. I found out about two programs, the McNair Scholars Program and the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Research Fellowship. I applied to both. I went to info sessions, applied to both. I did not get into McNair. I did get into Mellon Mays. And the whole purpose of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship is to set you off on a pipeline to become a professor. That's how I figured it out. I didn't do it on my own. I had that support, the mentorship. I was part of the first uh, cohort of Mellon May fellows at UCLA at the time. So we were guinea pigs in many ways, but we still received the support. And we're required to apply to graduate school. And to be frank, I don't even know if I would have done it if it hadn't been for that program. <laughs> for sure. And I, and I think those are the, the pieces of context that I think are important in, in sharing the story because sometimes it's assumed, you know, like you mentioned the roommate whose parents were the doctors and the lawyers and whatever. And they almost have this like, like a lifeline type thing where you can just pick up the yeah. phone and be like, what's the next step? And so understanding that programs exist that support students that may not have that lifeline of what is the next step is, is important, which I'm sure you do in your, inside your program. So you go into this path of becoming a professor. Do you ever have conversations with your mom about like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm on the path of being a, a professor in university? Or was it something because you lived outside of the home, something that you kept to yourself? Well... I, I mean, I did have conversations with my mom. I remember in undergrad when I would have conversations with her about what I was studying, I would tell her, you know, I'm studying English. And she would tell me, pero mija, you know, <laughs> tu, yeah, you, have, you speak really good English. Like, why are you studying English? And then when I told her that I wanted to become a professor and that I needed to continue on and get a PhD, once again, it was like, but why can't you just get a job right after mm. you graduate you know you're the first to to finish like why not get a job and so she didn't understand the concept of what a doctoral degree even meant I wasn't until I finished and then got my first job out of the PhD that she started to just show me off to everybody like mira that's my daughter yes doctora <laughs> but even to this day I don't think she a hundred percent understands what I do and how I do it. She knows that I now run my own business, set my own hours, work with clients, but it's very different from her business. That's more of like a product-based business and it's a brick and mortar shop. Yeah. Totally. Okay, let's take a quick coffee break and then we'll fast forward. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Yvette, do you drink coffee? I do. <laughs> I do. And I say it with like a little bit of a hesitation because a lot of people that, are, that have similar conditions as me in terms of chronic illnesses are not able to. So I'm like, I'm so grateful that I can drink coffee now, but I don't know at what point that might change because in some years past, I couldn't drink coffee. Mm. My stomach couldn't handle it. But right now I can. Uh, yes. And I do enjoy it. How do you drink your coffee? Pour over with the funnel. Very, I'm very simple. I am... 
I have friends who are coffee connoisseurs and co- or they call themselves coffee snobs. Mm-hmm. I am not one of them. So a part of me is like almost ashamed. Like I just drink basic coffee. <laughs> no shame. You can drink diner coffee and it's fine. We're not going to judge you. I just buy whatever I can find at Costco. I do grind my beans and okay. um, and yeah, so at least I do that. <laughs> yeah. Coffee is it's a very interesting world because there's levels of coffee snobbiness. <laughs> yeah. Me being someone who's been in that world, there's levels. Some people might consider me a coffee snob, but I'm actually not because I know people that are literally to a point where they would even roast their own beans because they don't trust the process of roasting and even like the heart, like it's it's a whole thing. So no What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fascinating. Yeah, I'm like I'm very very far away from that. I and it's funny because I I'm not sensitive to caffeine in in the way that some people are. Some people get jittery. I can drink caffeine at any time of day. Instead of it winding me up, it chills me out. So nice. <laughs> Wow, I wish you might find me drinking coffee. You know, at eight o'clock at night, no problem. Yeah. That's awesome. My cutoff is I've been pushing it a little. It used to be one o'clock. Now it's like 3 p.m., but that's like way pushing it. Yeah. I'm probably going to have some coffee after we're done with this. (laughs) I love that. I love that. A mi salud. Cheers. (laughs) Yeah. Do you have a favorite coffee shop that you visit that you want to give a shout out to? I don't, but I want to ask the listeners that if anyone is based in the Las Vegas area to send me your recs because I just moved here four months ago. So I'm on the lookout for any good coffee shops, local owned coffee shops. Yeah. yeah. We can ask Fabi from Latino School Lunch. He's from Las Vegas. Oh. <laughs> I might need to sneak into the DMs and ask. <laughs> yeah. He travels a ton, but he took me to a coffee shop. I met up with him a long time ago. We met at Public Us, and it's a coffee shop on Fremont and Maryland Parkway, South Maryland Parkway. Okay, so downtown. Public Us. Us Mm -hmm. Coffee. I'm going to check it out and report back. Yeah. It'll give me a reason to... To send you a message, <laughs> to stay in touch. Yeah, let me know, please. It was a really cool place, and that's a place we. I think I went. I met up with them with both when Babelito was still in Vegas. Probably twice we met at that coffee shop, once or twice, for sure. So, let us know what you think. Yeah, thank you for that wreck. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't expect it. I was like, hopefully <laughs> a listener will will message me. But that's even better. Look at Pam coming wreck. through. You know what? I'm. I'll probably go this weekend. I've got family coming over tomorrow, staying through the weekend, and I'll use. I'll bring that up as a rec. I even see there's a vegetarian option. Okay. Yeah, Good. they're really cool. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. Tag me on Instagram and all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to the show. Hola, bunnies. By the way, if you are enjoying this conversation and you want to keep talking about it, if you have some comments and maybe some questions that you have, follow me on social media and let's keep that conversation going. This is your reminder to screenshot and tag me at Cafe Con Pan Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and let's keep talking about it. Tell me what's resonating. Tell me what isn't. Tell me what do you wish I asked the guest This is your chance. And if you're on TikTok, I'm at Cafe Compan Pod as well. Let's stay connected. Bueno, Dr. Ivet. So you're on this path, this borrowed path of becoming a professor. You get the opportunity to work with students. You develop this autoimmune illness in grad school. You become a mom. When does your child diagnosis come in? When you were having your second child, you said? No, actually. I had my second child seven years later. Oh. Um, so I had my f- first child in graduate school. And actually, he, he, he developed some, like, some traits of potentially having like speech issues, speech disorder. Mm. So we got him in, in speech therapy right away at age one and a half. And then he continued on to receive services until pre-kinder. Or until transitional kinder, I should say. So uh, until age five. But at age three, 
we got him assessed and they, you know, diagnosed him as being on the autism spectrum. And at the time, I didn't know much. I mean, this was, he was three. So this was seven years ago. And I didn't know about the world of neurodivergence. I don't even think it was really a big thing that was spoken about on social media. It's not. It wasn't. And it was like this thing where we're like, we're so sorry. They hand you this packet of information. You're looking at this packet of information. You get so overwhelmed. You're like, oh my gosh, there's like, what is an IEP? And like, what what is, you know, this whole world of the regional center and working with therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, behavioral therapists, all the things. It was a lot. Mm. But, but I say but because that was that set me off on like, I'm going to need to advocate for my child from here on out. As the more I learned about autism, the more I realized, I, the more I learned about just neurodivergence in general, and I realized, oh, shit, like, my husband checks all the boxes. <laughs> so he right away was like, I see myself in my son. Like that's the way he is, is the way I was as a kid. And it was a big light bulb moment for him. And then for me, I realized, you know what, like there's other things like high sensitivity is a big, big thing Uh for me. Reading the book, The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine Aron changed my life because I realized, wow, like, yeah, I'm like, I'm not the only one because I always felt like there was something wrong with me. But I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. So it's actually set us off on this really empowering journey of owning our identities and embracing how we are and... I'm still learning to this day. I'm still, I'm, I feel like that's another one of my like side interests is reading and learning about neurodivergence. So, you know, I've got like books on my virtual shelf because I no longer read books. Physical books? No, I don't. I just listen to audiobooks or I have them as ebooks. I got rid of my entire collection of books. This was really, really hard. When I moved to Portugal in 2021. Oh my gosh. Did you cry? I would have cried. A little bit. <laughs> not as much as you would think. As an as a like former academic, not as much as I know other people would cry. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm that person like if you're not directly in front of me, I just forget you exist. Mm. So if my books are not directly in front of me, I forget I even had them. So I, it's that object permanence thing. <laughs> yeah. So how do you deal with with ebooks then? Because to me, I couldn't, I cannot, I can do audiobooks, I can do physical books. Ebooks, not a thing, because they just literally because of that reason, they're like a thing of the past. If you're not in front of me, I'm not gonna like read you. Oh well, I I have ebooks that I have saved on my computer, and I listen to it in audiobook fashion. So mm. I'm an auditory learner, and that you know kind of changed my life. Realizing that I'm like, ah, oh, someone. If only I had known this in grad school, I wouldn't have been struggling so much. I also have vision issues. Like my eyes get blurry. I get double vision. I I'm getting new glasses actually with Prism. Hopefully that helps me with my being on the screen and reading mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. But that's a thing. I just thought everybody struggled and I had to read things twice, three times just to get it. But audiobooks have have transformed my life. So I don't mind an ebook so long as I can actually usually like to scan information when I'm like going like, let me take a look at the table of contents, scan the information, see what I want to focus on. But in terms of actually sitting down and retaining information for extended periods of time, audiobooks all the way that's the only way I finish books now because before I would always just like read something and then stop and then like I just struggled with finishing books it's it's a shame thing for me like I didn't read I didn't read my first chapter book until I was in high school and so I carried a lot of sh- internalized shame growing up thinking that I was not smart because I couldn't finish books <laughs> yeah. whoa and now I'm like a bookworm <laughs> all the time. I've got something in my ear. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It's fascinating how the lived experience in our childhood shapes the way that we witness our whatever potential so-called success in adulthood. No? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always think of whose voice am I hearing when there's a sense of shame within me for having accomplished or not, for not finishing something or for doing something halfway. I'm like, what voice am I hearing that's telling me, that's shaming me for this? Going back to grad school, your kid gets the diagnosis, you developed a chronic illness. What made you keep going and finish like up to your doctorate? 
if you had realized that you don't want to be a professor anymore? <laughs> I still was on the fence. I'm not going to lie. I was still applying to academic jobs on the tenure track up until my last year of grad school. So I was still on the fence. I was still trying to seek security. And to me, pursuing the tenure track, potentially getting job security one day felt really, really safe. So I hadn't completely closed the door. It was ajar. Mm. And what helped me to keep going, sometimes I forget. Like, again, I have really bad all kinds of memory, really bad working memory, short-term, long-term memory. So sometimes I forget just how hard some parts of my grad school journey were. And then some things happen that trigger me. And then I realize, oh, right, that happened in grad school. So mm-hmm. one thing that comes to mind is that my husband, we recently celebrated our 15-year wedding anniversary. And Congrats. he was telling me, thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. That's a journey. It is. We've grown up together in many For ways. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) But he was saying, like, we've gone through so much and we've overcome so much. And remember when blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I don't remember. And he's like, remember when you were trying to quit your graduate program multiple times? I'm like, no, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And he's like, remember when you were struggling with severe postpartum depression? I'm like, yes, that I remember. And so what kept me going was my support systems. It was having a very supportive partner. It was having friends, you know, who became like my family, who who met up with me for co-working sessions, for writing groups. It was really that, the community that I formed, my my Chicana mother work, um, colegas, amigas, comadres. You know, I had another group that I was part of called the Mothers of Color in Academia, the UCLA. They also kept me going. So it's just like these different units of folks who helped to support me, who kept me going. That's awesome. I think that just shows the importance of having an ecosystem that supports you. Like there's no such thing as self-made. Not at all. It's always with lifting hands that support us. Yes. And that's the thing. Now I, I'm more self-aware. I'm still working on it, but I'm self-aware enough to start to pinpoint when voices in my head are actually the voices of tenets of white supremacy. You know, mm. and I think about whose voices in my head. Uh, why am I a recovering perfectionist? Why was I even a perfectionist to begin with? Yes. Because, you know, yeah, I can say it comes, it comes from my dad and forcing me to do things perfectly. Otherwise, I'd get whooped. Or I could think, where did my dad get that from? Why was he so, you know, so set on doing things a certain way and looking a certain way around certain people? Is Yeah, it's, it's, it's all rooted in patriarchy and white supremacy, sadly. 100%. So I, I'm an EFT practitioner. I don't know if you've heard of tapping. I have. I recently started getting into it, but I'm very, very new to it. But, although I, I'm not going to lie. I've been that person that I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. How can tapping actually do something? But you know what? <laughs> it works. <laughs> it's weird. I tell people it's weird. For sure. It does work. So there's different ways of tapping. I'm a clinical EFT practitioner, which means that I went to this like super extensive program to be able to support people as they process beliefs and many times deep ones. And also I am trained in, it's just like the name sometimes that these things, I'm like, why do you call it something so weird? Like, but this other thing is called matrix reimprinting. And so it's another way of tapping that it's fascinating because what we can do is we can explore the depth, basically in a nutshell, we can go into the depths of your mind and reprogram what we've believed. And we're able to get into into the memories, even generationally. And so recently, and I've done a couple of these that are like, whoa, where to bring it back to your perfectionism. So client went back to talk to younger her who had this belief around let's say i'm shifting the surf for confidentiality but let's say let's say perfectionism and so when younger self when we asked younger self what do you need she said i need my dad and so then when we brought dad then dad was like no i'm not ready to have this conversation to tell her that i'm proud of her because i need my dad to tell me that i'm proud of me and so we brought grandpa like it was this like series of like generations that were in the room in this like room in the mind of the client (laughs) where we got to also bring in younger dad whom had a conversation with his dad grandpa whom finally told him that he was proud of him and so when 
grandfather was able to tell dad, little young dad, that he was proud of him. Then dad, little dad, to big dad, they like were able to to reconcile that part of himself. And so then he finally was able to tell his daughter that he was proud of her. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So what what is that called? You said it's, con- it's called matrix reimprinting. So the idea is that you reimprint what's in the matrix. It's it's really cool. Interesting. I'm yeah. A, yeah. You know, it's it's funny because um, I've been like on this path of I, you know, my work is um, a quote unquote academic coach because I don't, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, I don't know what else to call myself. And I support people in navigating the grad school admissions process, applying, you know, going through essays, things like that. But I also support people with productivity skills, time management, um, all that, like what I call sustainable productivity. And it's funny because it's stuff that I'm like practicing in my day-to-day life, but a good portion of that work is personal growth and well-being oriented work. So it's healing work. And I'm like, oh shit, like I need to work on my healing to better serve the people that I'm serving. For sure. You know, it's only been recently that I've been intentionally pursuing my healing outside of the Western medical industrial complex. Totally. It's really cool. And it's one of those things that when you get into it, it's like, oh, I have a client that's like, you didn't tell me that this was never ending. And I'm like, well, you wanted to get into it. I never said it was going to end at some point. (laughs) (laughs) There's layers to this. Yes. Look, so... How did you start your business? So you've given us a little hint of what you do now, but tell me like more about who is it for, who comes to you, at what point in their life do they reach out? Is this something that people search for or is it more like you stumble upon them because you know they need you, but they may not know they need you? Yeah, so right now my clientele is a mix of undergraduates and graduate students who all self-identify as first-gen BIPOC in some way. The undergraduates who are my clients, I've actually attracted them through their scholarship programs who have hired me. So I'm, I'm working with a nonprofit who has uh, two scholarship programs, and they've got scholarship recipients all over the U.S. who are college students who are applying to graduate school. I've also worked with McNair programs. I used to direct a McNair program, so these are uh, graduate school preparation programs for low-income first-gen students. They've hired me to coach their students, not just with applying to grad school, but learning the sustainable productivity stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's uh, offering goal setting, time management, self-care workshops to their students. So that's for the undergraduate clientele. It's more B2B. B2C is with the graduate student clients. So the graduate students are actually coming to me directly. How are they finding me? A good portion of them are podcast listeners, and they've been listening to my podcast. So I have a podcast called the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. I've had it for about four years now. And so some people find me that way. Other people find me on Instagram. But they are coming to me because they're feeling stuck. They're lacking in support and structure. They might have neglectful advisors and they know they need help so that they can finally finish their freaking dissertations Mm -hmm. and finish and move on. Yeah. Super important. There's not that many of you. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a big world of uh, dissertation coaching and admissions uh, support consulting, but specifically working and supporting with low-income first-gen folks and doing it through a compassionate and social justice-oriented lens, that's not as easy to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us all the places and spaces where we can find you. You can find me uh, primarily on my website, gradschoolfemtouring.com. I'm also on Instagram. That's at gradschoolfemtouring. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn and that you find me through my name, Yvette Martinez Vu. Those are the three places that, you know, usually if you contact me in any one of those places, I'll get back to you fairly quickly. Give me 24 to 48 hours. But yeah, connect with me on all the places. I love meeting folks. Yay. Yeah, I love people considering the human pace because in the age of immediate gratification, people responding is not immediate. <laughs> Remind yeah, I say relatively quickly, but then I'm like, wait, 24 to 48 hours to some might not be quick, but I'm right. like, that's my pace. So, totally. and, that, and, the, and I mean business hours, not, right. <laughs> not 24, 48 hours if it's a long weekend. Yes. 
<laughs> if you message me on a Friday, expect something on Monday. Maybe Tuesday. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did your business start during the pandemic? Because I know you were going to mention something as the pandemic started. It started in 2021. So I left my career in higher ed at the, well, I left end of August, August 31st, 2021 to be exact. And I opened up my LLC September 1st, 2021. Mm. But I was in the middle of an international move. You came from Portugal? Well, I was working at University of California, Santa Barbara at the time. That was when I got the idea of I want to leave my job pursue entrepreneurship, move abroad. And so I started both of those things at the same time. I left mm. my job and then was pursuing both. Landed in Portugal December 2021, stayed there for a year and a half, then moved back. So I moved back this year, actually, just a few months ago in July. <laughs> and that's, yeah, so I'm, I'm still doing my business. And um, it's been a couple of years now. And what's next for me is I actually have a book coming out. Yay. It's called... Is grad school for me. I've had this book in my head since I was an undergrad. I swear, I'm like, where is this book? It's been mm. in my head. So is grad school for me demystifying the application process for first-gen BIPOC students? I co-authored it with one of my femtors, Dr. Miroslava Chavez-Garcia. And it's a labor of love. I was so excited to have, you know, a book that is tailored for historically excluded students to help them to navigate the grad school admissions process. And just not even that, it's a little bit of all the things um, that I provide support in. So it's, it's really to help people navigate what's the next step in their life. There's even a section of like, is grad school even necessary for you? Because trust me, for a lot of people, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure we send people off on the right track and not on the borrowed track, as you say. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And that was actually going to be my next question of what would you tell to people considering grad school, but not being sure that it's like for me, for example, I have been offered like, I would say, I'm not going to say multiple times, like two or three times by this dean teaching. And she's like, I would hire you like yesterday, but you don't have a master's and we need like, it's a requirement for you to have a master's. And I'm like, well, just for that reason, I'm not going to get a fucking master's. <laughs> and so that's gatekeeping. Yeah, very much so. Because I'm like, if you already know my skill, like what problem is there that I don't have the degree? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with, with there is this over, what is it like? This emphasis on like the over credentialing people. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't necessarily need to pursue degrees to do the work that we do. That's the same thing with like licensing. I have a lot of mixed thoughts about licensing and about the field of coaching, potentially becoming a field that like therapy requires a yeah. license one day. Mm -hmm. My take on grad school is there's a lot of reasons to not go. I can name a dozen reasons to not go. But there, for me, I usually stick to two main reasons to go. So if, if you fit one of these two reasons, you might want to go. So the first one is, is if you absolutely need it to advance in your career. If you know, you're like, I have always wanted to teach. I can't imagine not teaching. I have to do it all, you know, mm -hmm. and you have that hurdle of you, you're not allowed to pursue X because you don't have this degree, then do it. The second reason is some of us are lifelong learners and we have this itch and it's this mm -hmm. itch in the back of our head of like I want to do it I want to do it I want to do it and you know that if you don't do it one day it, you're always going to live with that regret then do it so those are the only two reasons anything else my mama told me my mentor told me I don't know what to do after college I'm trying to avoid paying my student loans borrowed reasons right yeah exactly no don't, no no none of those if it's intrinsic to you or if really is a is, you know, a hurdle that is it's one of those things that's going to help you to to get over a bump that's in your way, then yeah, pursue it. For sure. Thank you for that. I mean, I am a lifelong learner and... And you don't need to go to grad school to be a lifelong learner either. But it, some folks are like, no, I really, really want to get that whatever the next that degree, degree is. Yeah, yeah. I don't care about the degree. I would get multiple bachelors, actually. Like I, if I could like literally study all day, I would get a... a an undergrad and because it to me it doesn't matter like I don't know I would go back and study all the things but not like I could care less about the the title 
I've gone back and forth, like in my own experience of like, maybe I shouldn't have been an English major, maybe I should have been a sociology major or a psychology major or a Chicanic studies major or whatever, like all the things, because like you, I could just keep learning on and on and on and pursue multiple degrees. Yeah. But I don't want to. <laughs> I no longer want to go back. I can keep learning on my own. <laughs> totally. Well, Dr. Ibet, thank you so much for coming to Café con Pam. Let's ask you the last few questions. Do you have a remedio that you want to share with us? Yeah, I do. I am a big fan. This is going to sound very Cali of me, of green smoothies. So my green smoothie is like three-fourths greens, any green of your choice, one-fourth mm -hmm. fruit, any fruit of your choice. And make sure to add omega-3s. So add um, chia seeds, flax seeds, whatever seed of your choice. And water or almond milk or juice or whatever liquid you like. But for me, like consistently getting greens and omega-3s and hydrating. Hydrating is a big thing. As soon as I started hydrating more, one of my conditions, I have dysautonomia and folks who have this condition need to drink more liquids and more salt and more electrolytes than most folks. Mm. So yeah, hydration, green smoothies. If you don't like green smoothies, just add some more greens. If it helps you, because I'm a big proponent of like everybody pursue whatever makes them feel good. But for me, anytime I start to feel unwell, I know that my smoothies help me. Nice. Thank you for that. Do you have a quote or mantra that you live by? I do. For as long as, for probably as far back as undergrad, I've been saying this. I've been saying no means next. Mm. And recently I've started saying no means not yet. And this reminds me of... One of my you know, girlfriends reminded me the other day that for every 10 things you apply for, you might get one yes. Mm -hmm. So why say no to yourself? Why not just keep going? If you know if it's a numbers game, don't be the one to say no to yourself. Keep going. If, you know, if it doesn't work out this time, it doesn't mean it might not work out the next time. So that's a, that's a big one for me. I love that. And do you have a productivity tip, trick, or tool that you want to share with us? Yeah, but I have too many. I know. Like, <laughs> can we pick one? I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you a tool um, that I've been kind of messing around with that I've been having a lot of fun with. Um, I love AI tools just in general since, and since kind of recently a bunch of people have started getting into AI, including myself. And, you know, all in the last year, I've learned about a lot of different tools. And ev everybody talks about chat GPT. I recently started messing around with this uh, software called Descript. Are you familiar with it? I tried using the script, yes. Yeah, well, someone introduced me to it, and I was like, eh, it didn't feel intuitive. <laughs> yeah. And then they showed me how to use it, and when they showed me how to use it, I was like, oh, I don't have to pay for Loom anymore for my instruction. for Because I, I record a lot of screen capture instructional videos for my clients. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, I can use it like Loom. I also generate transcripts every week for my podcast episodes. So I'm like, oh, I can generate transcripts with it. And um, it just makes video editing super duper simple. So I guess right now I'm, I'm enjoying using Descript because it's multiple tools in one. Mm -hmm. And Descript recently acquired Squadcast then it's even a more kind of like all-in-one platform. I had Zachariah, one of the co-founders of Squadcast, on the show. Mm -hmm. And they recently sold to the script. So now they're, if you haven't looked at their podcasting tools, now they, they're doing more with that. Interesting. No, I'm not familiar with that. So yeah, yeah. another reason, see? Another reason, <laughs> for sure. AI tools are really really useful yeah we've been i've been using ai for about five years maybe because when i started podcasting there wasn't a lot of anything <laughs> even including humans like i didn't have the bandwidth the capacity yeah. the capital to support me and the and the show so i had to rely a lot in ai tools and so seeing the the growth of artificial intelligence in the world has been super cool to to witness and see and it being adopted by multiple industries, by various individuals is super fun. We're in the age of the robots. <laughs> <laughs> Although you still need the human touch. So I, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of AI. 
And I also know that, you know, if you learn how to use it, you you know, you're not going to get replaced. There's always that fear that people have. Um, but I'm, I'm all for embrace it, use it in ways that feel right to you, you know, create your own policies around how you're going to use these tools. But why not? If they're there, don't be afraid, try it out. And if you don't like it the first time, maybe try it out a second time. Cause I mentioned, I didn't like this script at first and then I gave it another chance and now I'm liking it. <laughs> Yay. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Ibet, thank you so much for coming to Cafe Con Pam. Stay shining. <laughs>